Okay, we're going to be hot in 15 seconds, people. Stand by. Queue open. Talent, check your spot. Audio up. Clear the set, everybody. Stand by camera three. Stand by camera one. Camera four, check your focus. Carol, make sure the phone guests are standing by. Stand by camera two. Okay, Don, we're ready out here. Okay, thanks. Let's rock and roll. Count them in. Ten, nine. Here we go. Eight, Flying graphic. Seven. Camera six, two, I'm going to be coming to you five, first. Stand by to Q mark. Four, three, two. And Q mark. Hello, I'm Mark Crutcher, president of Life Dynamics, and this is Life Talk for June 2015. And we're going to get started with Alan Ackles and this month's Life Talk news. Alan? All right, thank you, Mark. A new study conducted by Dr. Karen Mulligan at Middle Tennessee State University has found that since the morning after pill, or Plan B, became legally available over the counter without a prescription, the rate of sexually transmitted diseases has increased 12% for women aged 15 to 44 and 9% for all teenagers. The data showed that unrestricted access to the drug has reduced the likelihood that individuals will remain abstinent and that among those who are sexually active, they use condoms less often and have a higher number of sexual encounters. And contrary to what promoters of over-the-counter sales promised, there has been no measurable effect on abortion rates. Oklahoma Governor Mary Fallon has signed legislation making her state the fourth to have a 72-hour waiting period for abortion, tripling the 24-hour wait time previously required. House Bill 1409, which passed by an overwhelming majority, also requires abortion clinics to add a link on their websites to a state site which contains a photo of an unborn child, along with information about pregnancy, childbirth, adoption, and pregnancy helplines. In Missouri, a satanic temple is suing the state over their 72-hour abortion waiting period. Devil worshipers in the St. Louis-based organization are contending that abortion is a religious ceremony and that abortion restrictions place an undue burden on their ability to practice their religion. The suit was filed after a woman identified as Mary Doe claimed the law was a hardship for her. The Satanic Temple had originally set up a GoFundMe page to pay for the woman's abortion, but the page has since been removed. In Ohio, the number of abortion providers has shrunk by half in the past several years after a series of pro-life laws were passed. A review of abortion stats for the state conducted by the Associated Press revealed that the number of abortions is also declining. The data shows that since 2007, seven of Ohio's 16 abortion providers have either closed or curtailed abortion services, while an eighth in Toledo is operating under the cloud of pending litigation. The stats also saw elective abortions fall to the lowest level record since the state began tracking the data in 1976. The plunge places Ohio second in closures nationally behind only Texas, where more than half the state's abortion clinics have closed in just the last couple of years. Well, attorneys for New Hampshire Right to Life have filed a petition asking the Supreme Court to consider whether the Department of Health and Human Services can legally withhold information about a grant it awarded to Planned Parenthood of New England. The lawsuit alleges that in 2011, after the state refused to award funds to Planned Parenthood because of concerns that the money would be illegally used to subsidize abortion, HHS then granted Planned Parenthood a controversial sole source non-competitive replacement grant but has continued to refuse to provide details about the arrangement to the public. New Hampshire Right to Life is being represented in the case by Attorneys for Alliance Defending Freedom. And Alliance Defending Freedom also scored a victory in Rhode Island when the state decided to add plans to its state health care exchange that do not force members to pay for abortions. In response, the group dropped a lawsuit it had brought against the state in an effort to protect the right of citizens not to be forced to pay for abortions against their conscience. This leaves Vermont, Hawaii, and New Jersey as the only states with Obamacare exchanges that require all enrollees to pay a surcharge to fund the abortions of other enrollees. Well, the radically pro-abortion governor of Montana has vetoed, uh, vetoed a bill that would have banned telemed abortions in the state. Governor Steve Bullock also used a timing maneuver to effectively eliminate the possibility that his veto could be overridden by the legislature. Telemed abortions allow the abortion drug RU486 to be given to women over a Skype computer connection without having to meet with the prescribing physician in person. In Washington, D.C., the city council has unanimously passed a law that would prohibit religious and pro-life organizations from discriminating against employees who obtain abortions. 
The U.S. House then approved a measure mostly along party lines condemning the law in Senators Ted Cruz of Texas and James Lankford of Oklahoma introduced joint resolutions that would essentially void the measure. The Senate is expected to, vo uh, to vote on the resolution at any time, but Barack Obama has assured the abortion lobby that he will veto the bill even if it passes. In new guidelines issued by the Department of Health and Human Services, the, the Obama administration is forcing insurance companies to cover a wide range of contraceptives. Under the rules, uh, insurers must offer at no cost all of the 18 forms of contraception listed in the Affordable Care Act. Included among them are the morning after pill, Plan B, and other drugs known to act as chemical abortions. A California jury has found a 53-year-old pro-choice man guilty in the murder of his four-year-old daughter. Prosecutors say that Cameron John Brown hurled the little girl off a 120-foot cliff in order to get revenge against his girlfriend who had refused his demand to have an abortion while she was still pregnant with the child. They say his motive for wanting the girl dead was to avoid paying child support. According to the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office, Brown is expected to be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In Virginia, the Democratic Attorney General has stopped the closure of several abortion clinics after he intervened in newly enacted abortion regulations. The standards would treat abortion clinics as hospitals and cover issues such as hallway widths and closet sizes. In a statement to the state's health commissioner, Mark Herring said that the new standards should not be applied to existing facilities, contradicting the position taken by his Republican predecessor. Herring agreed with the abortion lobby who claimed the standards were only put in place to shut the clinics down. <clears throat> and finally, the Arizona Attorney General's office has arrested a woman who faked cancer in order to get a late-term abortion that she claimed was necessary to save her life, according to documents obtained by Life Talk News. 29-year-old Clarice, or that's Chalice, Renee Zeitner, forged a doctor's note to qualify for a government-funded abortion while on Arizona's Medicaid insurance. Maricopa County officials charged Zeitner with numerous felonies and issued a warrant for her arrest after the physician she claimed was treating her cancer told investigators that he had never met her. Alan Ackles here for Life Talk News. You can get daily news updates by logging on to ProLifeAmerica.com. Mark, back to you. Thanks, Alan. Well, we're all back, except for Troy's off this month. My trusty yes. sidekick here, Renee. Hello, Renee. Hello. And Destiny, the way of suffering, Herndon De La Rosa. We're tired already. We're huh? tired of that joke. It, you don't think go. it works? It works. Nope, it's done. It it's works. dead. I talked to your husband about it. He said, No, nope, bury it. <laughs> it's done. And Father Frank wandered back at this Good month. Good to be back. You're not hobnobbing with the Pope and hanging out in Italy. No, and, we, you know. You know <laughs> right. We'll be back soon. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> God. We'll be back down at the square, right? Yeah. Right. He'll be back in Italy right. with the Pope. Eating catfish. Um, got a lot of stuff today, as we always do. First off, we got a, another sad note. Uh, Karen Malik, who's the um, head of the uh, Coalition on Abortion and Breast Cancer, uh, passed away. And... Um, you know, I, we'd had her on the show, I think, two or three times in, in the years past, and she had fought this battle uh, long and hard, and uh, she passed away just a few days ago. So, it, well, actually, in May, May 6th, she passed away. And you know, Mark, in January, we were happy to present her an award uh, in Washington on the morning of the March for Life. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, yes, the National Pro-Life Religious Council gives a reward each year. So we actually had Karen, and she was able to come, which was a great, great right. blessing. Uh, she was able to come, and we also honored... Um, Angela Lanfranchi and Joel Brent. And of course, as you know, the three of them together have done such heroic right. work, persevering through all kinds of obstacles to, to raise the awareness of the connection between abortion and breast right. cancer. Yep. Well, um, let's get, get to some of this. I'm going to get a few of these short stories out of the way first. Uh, once again, you know, we've talked before about how every time there's a, there's a medical breakthrough, and, and the point here is, the devastation that abortion has wrought on the medical community. I mean, because it, it's changed their whole attitudes about life and about, about and, and, and across the board, not just with the unborn. But now there's a um, new test for uh, Down syndrome that you can actually do at home yourself. And they say it's about as accurate as the test that you'd, you'd go to a doctor and get. And uh, once again, it, as, as it always has in the past, when, when these medical breakthroughs come along, what the medical community is seeing the big breakthrough here is, is now you can decide about having an abortion earlier. That's, that is the danger of it because it's the cheap way out. When these women find out that their baby may have Down syndrome and there's only a 90% chance, 
there's still that 10% that the baby said there's nothing wrong with the baby, they're going to go ahead and abort. They're not going to go to another physician to right. do further testing. Or to get a second opinion. Or, yeah. And look, that's why we see right now, was it 97%, I think we saw 97% of all the babies diagnosed with Down syndrome. Nine out of 10. Yeah, yeah over nine out, almost 100%, 97% yeah. are killed in the womb. So, you know, I guess, and, and you know what, I, the strange thing here is because of the, of the attitude of our enemies uh, toward life, I think when you sit here and say, we've just about wiped out Down syndrome in one generation, right? They think this is a positive thing. And, and, and the method by which we used to, to, to eradicate it was by killing all the people who have it. You know, so we can eradicate any social ill by doing that. So if we look out here and we say, uh, I'm going to make a concerted effort to eradicate homelessness. And since I can't get homes for all these people, we're just going to line them up and shoot them. Kill the homeless. Yeah. And everybody, that, so we eradicate homelessness in, in one year. We can do it in one day. Just have every police department in the country go down to wherever their homeless area is, gather up all those people, take them out somewhere and shoot them. Mm -hmm. Homeless, you see, homelessness is eradicated. And the underlying uh, philosophy, of course, is we've eradicated homelessness or we've eradicated Down syndrome. Why? Not because it's good for them, because it's good for good us. Good for us. Right. Right. You know. This idea that this is compassion, and this is what just angers me so so bad about our our enemies, the people that we fight against. Is, Hopefully, it, oh sorry. Is they'll say that, well, it, you know, you want that child to live this life, you know, in the, in this situation. Well, you're not offering this child a better life. You're offering this child no life. Right. And have you ever seen children who are happier than, than children Down with Down syndrome? syndrome. Children. I think are. it's our so perception. True. You're right. It's a burden on society or on the parents. But really, what does any parent want? Like, we want happy children who are just enjoying life. And these children enjoy life much more than probably, I would say, most children do. Right. You know, this is another twist. I've been thinking a lot recently about this uh, on the whole idea of do not judge. You know, the other side always tries to right. say that. To, oh, do not judge. When you say, oh, that person's not going to be happy in their life, that person with Down syndrome, that person with a terminal disease, that person with this, that, or the other thing, who are you to judge the happiness of another person? You can't. Right. First of all, you can't enter into their mind and heart and their emotions. But secondly, it's just it's a haughtiness. It's an arrogance. Mm -hmm. It is an arrogance. And, I, and it, I, I used to, when I used to, when they're back when there were debates on abortion, and, and I'd always say, have the courage of your convictions. Let's round up all of the... One-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, every person in this country that has Down syndrome, let's round them up and lethally inject them. Because if they're living this miserable life that you say these unborn babies are going to live, isn't it more compassionate to kill them that, who are already living that life than these over here that might live it? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to say we're going to kill these out of compassion, it's a bastardization of compassion is what I used to call it. That's right. If we're going to, if we're going to kill them out of compassion, it's way more compassionate to kill somebody that's six years old. So have the courage of your conviction. And like you said, Mark, when there used to be debates about abortion, right. it, it, it's, it's so telling that these people don't want to debate. I mean, we're ready anytime. And you, you ready? Let's go. Let's go. Right. They don't want to. Right. They back down. Yeah. They, no, they just don't even do it. And, and a matter of fact, they're, uh, we're going to talk a little bit of that, about that later in the show. They're going out of their way to make sure they don't have to engage us. That's right. They're trying to silence the pro-life movement. Used to, their, their argument was, let's go up against them. We'll fight them in the streets and we'll, we'll fight them in the college campuses, we'll fight them wherever we have to. Now it's, we can't beat them, so we're, we're going to try to silence them. Um, but this idea that you're going to use death as a way to solve social problems is um, an obscenity. But that's what they're saying. And, and, and they're right, though. We can solve any social problem if we just kill enough of the right people. That's a correct uh, statement. Um, here's another thing. We're, when we're seeing more and more of this, I only picked out, we had several of them this month, but I only picked this one. Um, a 24-year-old woman has a baby and at, apparently has it at work and um, puts her baby in a plastic garbage bag like, a, like we'd put, take out the trash in and sets it beside her desk and goes back to work. She puts the baby in the drawer, yeah. And the baby suffocates. And dies. And now, now my, my question is, and again, going back to the debate era, back when it was, used to happen, every, I, I can remember being in debates where the parole boards would bring up saying, well, this woman did something like this. She killed her baby, or this 15-year-old this girl left her baby in the, in the toilet at the, at the high school or whatever. 
And that's because they couldn't have abortion. Abortion was start, supposed to stop all this. We're seeing more of it today than we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because what we've talked about here on the show before, we've destroyed the maternal instinct in so many women now that, the, you know, this woman is, is sitting there saying, hey, I could have killed this baby legally a couple of days ago. What's the big problem here? Right? That's right. So, and, and I would say also, if you look at late term abortions and you know how maybe it's harder to access them or they're more expensive, like, yeah, this is the, the economy version of that. This is the budget friendly one. Okay, I can have an abortion now or I can just wait two weeks, give birth and do it myself. You know, it's the DIY of abortion. And it's disgusting because we've dehumanized a whole sect of humanity that these children's lives have no value. Well, well and they have, value, it's, excuse me, they have value only to the extent of what they do for us. They don't have intrinsic value. If we want them, right, and and they're going to feel some need in our in our lives, then then they're then they have a right to life. But if they if if they don't want them, and they don't feel some need of ours, then they have no right to life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, they're trying to claim that she's mentally ill, and yes, she is mentally ill to do that. All pro abortion mentally ill. She knew yeah. what she was doing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. Um, we had a situation here at a uh, in Ohio at the Founders Women's Health Center. Um, a woman is driving past and there was a, a created equal display there with, with mm -hmm. aborted babies uh, in, front of this, in front of this death camp. And she had had an abortion. And she stops and comes and starts talking to these people and telling them how much she appreciates them being there. If, they had, if she had seen this stuff, she wouldn't have done what she did and so forth. And while she's there, some people came up that were gonna have an abortion. And she talked to them and said, hey, and, and they're mad about the science and stuff. She talked to them, and they changed their mind about having an abortion. So the signs lured a woman in who had not seen these and had killed her baby. And because of that, they talked another woman out of killing her baby. Yeah, watching the video, I just teared up because she, she is still in pain from having that abortion years ago. Still devastated. Yeah, you mean the woman that stopped? The woman that stopped, yeah, that, yeah. that had the abortion that stopped right. that other couple. It's, but now she saved somebody else's baby. She did. Yep, so. Well, and the thing that she kept saying that I thought was powerful is she kept saying, nobody was advocating for my child. Like, nobody was out here advocating. Nobody and I think that's there. why it's so important, you know, no matter which techniques you embrace, that somebody be out there and present and offering resources and offering an alternative because otherwise people do. They assume it's legal. It's not like, you know, I'm having to really go to a back alley, even though that's definitely what most of these clinics look like inside. So they think if it's legal and accessible, then, then what's wrong with it? And if nobody's outside to say, Think this about is this. not the right choice. Yeah, right. we have a better option for you, a nonviolent option, then that's right. the decision right. too many women make. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's a, such a big part of the healing for those that have had abortions is that not only they get a chance to advocate for the unborn children of others, but that they see others advocating, that, that's part of the healing. Right. You know, healing after abortion and pro-life activism go together yeah, very, absolutely. very well. Some people think that they're, you know, these are two separate universes or that even they're in opposition to each other. That's not true at all. No, no it's not. I think it's almost like the parenting thing of the do as I say, not as I do type thing. And it's not that you're a hypocrite in any way, but it's you've traveled this path and you know how hard it is and you yeah. want better for other people. You don't yeah. want there them to go. have to suffer the same way Well, and again, we've, we've talked about this before with Renee. When you first came here, you were kind of astonished <clears throat> that at the number of women that are in the pro-life movement that have had abortions. Yes. That was a shock for you. Mm -hmm. It took you some time to, to kind of process that. But. Right. They're one they're of the dead. most powerful voices I think they the movement are. has. Yes. Yeah, because they've been there. And they also yeah. know what would have stopped them. So when we talk to them and say, yes. what would have stopped you? Would it have been someone out on the sidewalk? Would it have been resources offered? Would it have been someone advocating because you had a parent or a boyfriend who was coercing you? Um, they're the ones who can actually say, I was here, and I think it mm -hmm. also makes them great advocates out on the sidewalk because they can go to that woman, and it's not just this high and mighty, oh, we, you shouldn't do this because, you know, religious reasons, or I have this logical argument, but it's because I've seen the pain that it mm -hmm. wreaks, you know, on your life. Exactly. Yeah. Um, these, these, it's unbelievable. It, it, we've got a new governor, uh, Terry McAuliffe, hardcore leftist, raging pro abort, yes. former member of the, of the uh, Clinton administration years ago. Um, he's now the governor of Virginia, unfortunately. And Virginia, the legislature there had passed some new regulations to help bring abortion clinics up to some sort of minimal standards that you would at least get out of a vet clinic or something. Um, and he's now saying that, that
states abortion clinics don't have to follow that, just neutralizing it and just unilaterally on his own. So the emperor has spoken, in other words. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, he's appointed some people to the board that oversee this that are have ties to Planned Parenthood and that are pro aborts out speaking uh, in favor of abortion and against any kind of clinic regulations. He's appointed them to the board that oversees this thing and says, oh, they don't have to, they don't have to go along. Don't worry about it. They're armed. The great irony is all of these protesters who say, well, now we're going to have to have back alley abortions if you shut down our clinics. Like, what's the difference? What's the difference? You right. have the back alley on Main Street. That's the only difference. They're allowed to advertise in the yellow pages. But it right. is the back alley. It's on Main Street. It's still on the back alley. You know, the, mm -hmm. I think one of the most chilling statements I ever heard, we, we talked last month about how um, Christy Style finally mm -hmm. passed away mm -hmm. from her abortion, her safe and legal abortion. Her mother told me one time, she said, I, before, before uh, this happened to Christy, she said, I thought it was safe. She said, I didn't know any different. That's, that's all you hear is that, that it's safe. And she said, what I discovered was that the only difference between illegal abortion and legal abortion is your child bleeds to death with Muzak playing in the background. <laughs> and, you know, that's kind of chilling when yeah. you think about it. She said, there's real soft music playing in the background and everybody's wearing nice white clothes and your child's laying there bleeding to death. That's horrifying. Um, mm, yeah, it's... I think I think you know that governor. Every time there's one of these emergencies in one of those abortion mills in in Virginia, besides the the emergency medical people getting the call, of course the abortionist usually doesn't call them anyway. Right. The governor should get a call. Right. What, 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 you know, let him know. Okay, another 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 emergency. This woman they just butchered. Do you yeah. feel any responsibility right. for this? You should go witness it. Not just he get should. a call, but go witness should it. Should go witness it. Right. That's right. Right. Uh, in Louisiana, we've we've been talking about the uh, abortion mill. They're trying to build this Planned Parenthood gigantic abortion mill in um, New Orleans. Um, some pro-lifers put up just very very simple little billboards, nothing graphic, nothing you know in your face, just um, talking about how this is going to be an abortion mill. And of course, the pro-aborts have gone berserk over that, started defacing the this stuff and doing other. Vandalism. That would be a perfect place to put a billboard that says Planned Parenthood doesn't care about black people. Like to right. play on the George Bush doesn't care about black people. I mean, why right. do you think Planned Parenthood's going to New Orleans? Peter Singer's back at it again. We talked a little bit about this last month. He's head of medical ethics or biological ethics at Princeton University, which is mind boggling when you think about it. <laughs> but um, he's, we talked about last month about how these guys were saying there ought to be a certain length of time after the after, child is after born, birth. Mm -hmm. that the parents can, you know, look at the baby and see if he's healthy and, oh, are we bonding with him? And is mm -hmm. being a parent really what we thought it was going to be? And if not, take the baby in somewhere and have him euthanized. And now <clears throat> you have more and more people coming out. One group saying this should extend up to five or six years old. So you could take your five-year-old in and, and have them euthanized. You know, <laughs> you've got three teenagers. You probably think it might be a good idea, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, not a chance. <laughs> Uh, well, you've come in in the mornings and said some things. <laughs> Mark. Right. Hey, I went through it, believe me. But um, he's now saying he doesn't want to see his tax dollars going to pay for disabled babies. So it is, it's about money. It, you know, about if money. they were free to take care of them, I guess it'd be okay. But he, does, he says, I don't want taxpayer money going to pay for babies who have a, a marginal quality of life. So again, his quality of life. Mm -hmm. It's worth protecting, right. but not theirs. And he didn't want to see his money going to pay for it. You know, you know, this, where do they get five years? I mean, I mean when you think about it, when you it's buy arbitrary. into their philosophy, yeah, five years is just as arbitrary as people say, oh, well, yeah, I'm pro-choice, but not after 12 weeks. Well, what happened? What, what happened? And what happens on the fifth birthday? Right. And what happens at the tenth birthday? I mean, this philosophy really followed to its logical conclusion doesn't allow any limits whatsoever. None. Well, it, you know, when, when I used to argue with these people, that, like you said, they said, oh, I'm opposed to abortion. Now, up, up, to, the, up, up, to. up to eight or nine weeks, I'm okay. And I'd say, okay, what's your, what's your cutoff date? Uh, Twelve weeks. Okay, tell me what happens on Sunday night of the 11th week. <laughs> not just that, but they're in, in daycare if, if the parent's not a stay-at-home parent. Right. So they're paying for child care, and then when they turn five, they go to school, and they don't have to pay really for child care anymore until after school child care. Right. So It's outrageous. The whole thing is outrageous. <laughs> but it, this, is the, this is the trail you go down 
Because if you say that life begins at any time other than the moment of fertilization, right. if you say it begins at any time other than that, it's it's strictly arbitrary. You're just grabbing it out of the air because you got nothing to base it on. That's right. You know, and if nothing else, one of my arguments that I used to use was, life has to begin at fertilization because there's no other point that it can begin. Because any other any other point you you uh, you grab is just purely arbitrary. It's just an opinion. Right. Mm -hmm. So what about the guy who kills his three year? That, you know, we had a story in the news. The guy throws his four-year-old mm -hmm. off a 120-foot cliff mm -hmm. because he's mad at the mother because she wouldn't abort that child when, when the child was still unborn. And what's, why is his argument that, what if he, his defense in court is, look, I don't think life begins until a kid's five. I talked to Peter Singer. Talk to Peter Singer. Talk to these other people. I don't think life begins until you're five. What makes his argument that life begins at five any less valid than somebody else's argument that it begins at 12 weeks in the womb. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's just purely arbitrary. Or that it stops at 60. I yeah. Mean, or that it, it stops circle. at 60. Yeah, that's that right. quality of life once you, you know, have any type of ailment or on a certain number of medications, because that certainly costs money, then... Hey, I'm 67. What, what are you... What are you yeah. I mean, I might sign on to it. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, you see, I mean, this is, this is what I often say about the relationship between law and belief. The, we're not advocating that the laws should impose anybody's beliefs. We're saying the law is supposed to protect people from people's beliefs. Right. That's so the right. person who doesn't believe before five years old you have a right to life, you know what? Believe what you want. But you can't take that. You can't life. impose it on this child. That's the point. Yeah. Right, right. Um, we asked last month. We had that a story about the the New York state legislator who was um, saying that women love abortions and that they're happy that they, they get to have abortions and so forth. And I asked you what's in the water. The craziness there. of New York. I know. Um, I was waiting for that. <laughs> and yeah, right. Well, we got to pick on the Yankees, right? That's what, that's what they're there for. Um, and and we had talked sometime in the past about Renee's little buddy up there, Tommy the Chimp. Yes. And, and where was Sandra, his girlfriend? In Argentina. But she was an orangutan. Right. So you couldn't get those two together because it would have been a mixed right. marriage. But anyway, they were trying to get Tommy ruled a person. Right. And they couldn't do it. A non-human person and they couldn't do it. But Sandra and, and uh, Argentina, they were able to. So As she a, is. So chimps are, but orangutans. I mean, orangutans are, but chimps aren't. That's right. Okay, but now in New York, a judge has ruled that chimpanzees do have legal rights as persons, right? What? what is, <laughs> what's going on up there, Father Frank? You got to explain this to me. What is the problem with these people? Maybe it's less Hercules. about making animals humans and more about making humans animals, do you think, to some extent, where we can no, it's just... No, making them the same. But, I mean, yeah, where we can just, you know, take a dog to the SPCA and euthanize it. I mean, basically, they're wanting to do the same thing with people. So if we can make everyone just this base level of, you know, an animal, then it becomes easier to kill them. Well, and they're, that's, what they're, that's the language they're using, yeah. non-human animals yeah, and human animals. There you yes. go. Non-human animals. Hmm. Well, anyway... I don't think it passed, though. I think it was rejected. Well, I'm, what I'm saying is, though, you had a judge oh, okay. that okay. took this position. They did take it, yes. Right. Right. Yeah. And Hercules here, this is Hercules. We named him here in the office Hercules Hobbs. Hobbs, yes. After you, because <laughs> know, he had a, right. there's a strong family well, resemblance. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, anyway, Hercules Hobbs, and I guess it's his brother Leo. Was that right? Yes. No, no since you're Tommy and Sandra are now turned into Hercules and mm -hmm. Leo. Leo. But anyway. I, you gotta, you gotta do something up there. This is bad. I know <laughs> these people are nuts. Take charge. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Oxford, doctors have found they're doing research into pain. Found that newborn babies experience pain at a higher level than adults. Now, years ago, there was a study that showed unborn babies, even as early as eight or ten weeks, exper experience pain at a higher level than adults, because of the way the nerve receptors mm -hmm. are, are formed at that point. Well, now we've got this study coming out, and they've actually, actually shown how the, the brain waves function in these, in these newborn babies, the babies mm -hmm. that are just hours old, and how they respond to pain. Now, the pro-aborts will say there's no evidence that unborn children feel pain. So, in other words, when we rip their arms and legs off and crush their skulls mm -hmm. and everything, oh, they're fine. What's the difference? They're fine. Don't worry right. about it. Um, they, don't, they don't experience any kind of pain, which we know is nonsense. But here's my question then. 
If we can now demonstrate that a newborn baby, just a, few, a couple hours old, <clears throat> feels pain at a higher level than an adult, did that magically occur as that baby was ex exiting the birth canal? Hmm. Or, is it, or do we now know, if we have irrefutable evidence then, that this bright line that these, guy, these guys draw at the moment of birth doesn't exist? That if you move them back in, into the womb, mm -hmm. they feel pain. Either that, or you've got to you've got to make this argument about the birth canal being some sort of mystical place where all kinds of things happen in that few seconds that that baby's in that birth canal. All of a sudden, now it starts feeling pain. Mm. That's nonsense. No rational person could possibly believe that. Right. I mean, I think I do have a magical birth canal. I'm just gonna. I have some who are pretty amazing kids, so maybe I do. But I would say. Well, wait. That were the they point, amazing before they went through the birth canal, or that that what did it? I think it's just. I, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I think the I grew them. I grew them that way. But I will say that <laughs> the interesting thing to me is, if this is true, if they really don't feel any pain, then let us document a lot of your sonograms. You know, as you're doing the sonogram while you're doing abortions, because we've seen multiple sonogram videos where the child, a tiny, you know, a to 12 week is moving away from Pushing the suction. The if they away. can't right. even feel the suction, how do they know to move away from, you know, the cure? How do they know? Well, and you know, not only that, but the fetal pain researchers will tell you one of the one of the determinative things here is it's a full body response. Yeah. It, and when the doctor hits your knee with a reflex reaction, it's just your lower leg that moves. These babies, when they're moving away from a painful stimulus, are, are giving a full body mm -hmm. response. Mm -hmm. and, and that indicates, you know, all those, those mechanisms for feeling pain, the receptors on the skin to the nerves and, and the spinal cord up to the brain are, are in place and are working. And, the, and, that, and that's what you need to feel pain. Okay. Um, I'm out of deception. We talked last month about this uh, Presbyterian minister down in New Orleans, it's welcoming, holding ceremonies, welcoming the Planned Parenthood in down there. We've talked several times about Georgetown, one of your favorite places to defend. What's, what's going on there, Father Frank? You need to explain that too. <laughs> um, at their commencement ceremonies, they are honoring, at their commencement ceremonies, at a supposed Catholic university, which I would argue is not Catholic, they're honoring people who are raging pro abortion yeah. Yeah, you know, it is the season now. You know, all these commencements, oh, yeah. you know, in, in recent weeks that we, you know, have been happening across the country. And it, it, every year it's the same thing. Cardinal Newman Society, by the way, you know, is one of the pro-life groups that tracks, right. you know, who's right. honored, who's invited to speak. And it is constantly a litany of this kind of bad news. St. Norbert College in De Pere, Wisconsin. Hmm. Do you know who they had for their commencement speaker? Or she's not a commencement speaker. She was, they were there for a dialogue. This is a Catholic university. Mm. Gloria Steinem. And she's at this Catholic university touting the, the wondrous benefits of abortion and ridiculing the Catholic church for its opposition to abortion at a Catholic university. Why is this tolerated? Yeah. Now, the bishops have said we're not supposed to be giving not only awards, we're not supposed to be giving platforms, and and, and that's that's obviously a, a platform for these 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 uh, these people, to to uh, folks that are that are uh, advocating abortion. We're yes. not supposed to be giving them a platform. Okay, continuing with my with my long espoused theme that being pro-choice is a mental disorder, which it, it obviously is. There's something wrong with you if you buy into that. Um, we saw this past Mother's Day. Huffington Post, talking about what a wonder, wonderful advance for mothers legalized abortion has been. Uh, Planned Parenthood sending out Mother's Day emails, talking about how, how excited they are to be for, for young mothers, the, you know, the ones whose babies survived Planned Parenthood. Um, these, these people are nuts, I'm telling you. Um, you watched a video you told me about uh, a guy in Canada. Well, I think you saw the same video, did you not? This guy in Canada. The March for Life. The well, anyway, you, you um, they interviewed this guy, and, and basically oh, yeah. they're trying to, to get him to give his, he's a bro-choice guy, right? Yes. And he's trying to give his, his uh, defense of legalized abortion. Right. He basically is saying right up to the moment of birth, yeah, he's, he's okay with that. Right, and after. He's okay with that. And it's after. a woman's choice. It's a woman's choice to kill yes. her babies even after birth. Right. But then... He doesn't want them to put that out into the public. Yes, he sends an email to, to tell her not to put it out there. He doesn't want his name out there. 
She does anyways. So That's public he, information. And this guy, he recognizes that he's got a mental disorder, that there's something wrong with him. Have you ever, in your life, any of y'all, have you ever espoused a pro-life view and then told the media person that you were talking, oh, don't, don't tell everybody that's what I believe? Are you so, ashamed so, of your, so, so of your views, Father Frank? It's so self-contradictory, you know. Then, then don't say it. They don't, know, don't hold it. Don't, they know their, def their position yeah. cannot be defended. Be defended, that's right. They know it for a fact. And mm -hmm. this guy, the thing is, he had a really aggressive sign that I think even had the F word in it. Oh, I mean, yeah. standing out there feeling very proud of his beliefs. But if you look, his belief wasn't um, anything more than passivity. It was, well, it's a woman's choice. Well, I think a woman should be able to choose. Like, putting the onus of the whole decision on the woman constantly. Uh, but yet, he's the one there with the sign. So I wasn't surprised at all that in the end he said, I actually don't use my name because he doesn't have an opinion. He just thinks it should be up to the women. Like, leave us alone. We don't want to deal with it. Well, he made a fool out of himself to, be to begin with because she asked him if he thought um, having an abortion a month before a woman was due, if that was okay. And he said, well... And then he recanted and he said, no, it's a woman's choice. He said, I'm, I'm digging my own grave here. Yes. I know I'm digging my own grave here. Yep. And then he just kept going, yeah. stop. But you know what? That's the thing you say when someone's digging their own grave, like get out of the way. I've heard you Let say that. Dig. And she yeah. did and it was awesome. Right. Yeah. When, you're fooled, when, you're, when your enemy's making a fool of himself, keep your mouth shut. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you'll never regret keeping your mouth shut in that event. Um, but anyway, like I said, even they know that their position can't be defended. Here's an article about a woman who paid an abortionist $25,000 because her baby had a brain malformation, she claims. She paid her abortionist $25,000 to euthanize her child at 36 weeks. Mm -hmm. 36 weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what she called it. Call it euthanasia. And she had... I think she got a phone call on Monday, and she had to be in the States by Friday to have the abortion before it went over to the 37th week or something like that. So she's obviously affluent, wealthy enough that she probably could have helped sustain some quality of life for the child after birth, but she chose to put that money towards But that, again, this goes back to that thing we talked about, this bastardization of compassion. Mm -hmm. She's trying mm -hmm. to justify all of this by talking about how the baby would have suffered. No. She was worried about how she was going to suffer. She would have suffered, yeah. She, this, this execution of children with Down syndrome or with whatever problem this child had is not done for them. It's done for us. Let's, let's just step up to the bar and admit that's what the, what the situation here is. And then the sad reality is it doesn't deliver even for us. Nope. nope. It brings us pain. Um, we're talking about these nutcases. Planned Parenthood attorney, in a case uh, they're, they're arguing, um, was asked the same thing about when is it appropriate to protect the unborn. And he says, quote, our position is that it's not appropriate at any point in pregnancy to apply a certain set of rights to that developing pregnancy. Nobody is arguing that pregnancies, pregnancy is a condition. It's, it's, it's not a person, it's, not a, it's a condition. Nobody is arguing that a pregnancy has rights, but he cannot bring himself to use the word that that developing child, fetus, whatever you want to call it, at any point in the pregnancy has any rights. Just acknowledge that, they, even to acknowledge there is an entity there, Right. these people can't He's taking can't the same position as this, <coughs> as this nitwit in, in, in Canada, mm -hmm. right? At no point. Well, because they can't. They can't give any ground, and that's how you see groups like NARAL painting themselves into a corner. A few months ago when the woman um, had met up with the Craigslist person, remember, and then she right. cut the baby out of her stomach, and they found themselves constantly sticking their foot in their mouth, basically defending a murderer for killing this child because they cannot give any personhood whatsoever to the unborn. They can't give any status of any they sort. Can't. Of any sort. Um, this, this, this guy's name's Kevin Paul. He's a, a Planned Parenthood mouthpiece um, attorney. He, he, the man, would you want a guy in defending you in a court action that cannot use basic English language? We're not going to give rights to a developing pregnancy. <laughs> At least they finally caught on to the fact that fetus means, what does fetus mean? Little one. Little, little one. one. Little one. So they know better than to use Listen that Listen to this language. Of anymore. course, when we get, this is him, this Kevin Paul nitwit. Of course, when we get into definition of terms like human being and child, we have to take into account individual concerns and individual backgrounds, cultural differences, religious differences, uh, all sorts of differences between us individually 
And those are words that are sometimes hard to define in our public policy in a way that is appropriate for application to everyone. This is nonsense. What this is, is double talk. Yeah. Um, if we can't say, if we can't look at you and say, you're a human being, well, what if somebody in, in some culture says, well, women really aren't the same. Do we have to accommodate their views if they happen to move to the United States and say, well, women aren't really the same, and they're not, they're not culturally, they're not biologically, they're not physically anything similar to us as males, mm. so therefore we can own them or we can beat them up or we can rape them or we can do whatever we want to do with them. Um, would, we, would this guy be arguing that we have to accommodate that view? Because that's what he's saying here. When he it would have to. He would have to argue. Yeah, no, that's he wouldn't. Because there's no consistency with. with these people. <laughs> um, again, down in um, New Orleans, another pastor is saying that the abortion business is a resurrection. These people are resurrection workers, and that he thanks God for Planned Parenthood and calls it a ministry. Mm -hmm. Another church issue. Um, another pro-abort. Again, I don't want to get into this too much. In the daily costs talking about um, she aborted her disabled baby, and at least this woman was, was honest. Called it a baby? Yeah, she said she had an abortion because she wanted a better baby. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. At least she's honest. She's not trying to say, I did this out of compassion for the baby. I wanted a better baby than the one I had, so I killed it. Yeah. It's, don't it's tell sad me. that stuff like that is refreshing to hear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we got a couple of guests we want to bring on. First off, our old friend Ryan Bombarger. We, we all have been covering and talking here about his um, attack that he was under from the NAACP. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll just bring him in. Hello, Ryan. Hey, how are you? I'm just fine, sir. Nice to see you with us. Happy, thank you for coming on real quickly. Um, just real quick, give us an update on your, on your lawsuit that the NAACP sued you. Tell us. Tell the, refresh the audience's memory, because we've talked about this several times, what they sued you about. Well, back in 2013, they sued us because they got a Google alert about an article that I written for LifeNews.com, in which the title of the article was the National Association uh, for the Abortion of Colored People. They didn't like that so much and threatened to sue us uh, for monetary damages, for trademark infringement, dilution, confusion. But the only confusion apparently was on their side. Um, they forgot that. <laughs> One of the most basic civil rights is free speech, but they went ahead and sued us, and they won at the lower court level, and we just got a ruling back from the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, who uh, rebuked, strongly rebuked the lower court ruling, overturned it, and said there is in no way, shape, or form any trademark infringement here. This is completely protected by the First Amendment, and so we were victorious, thanks to the Lord, and to the Alliance Defending Freedom, who stood by us the entire time. Uh, we're victorious over the NAACP. That's great. So is, is this the end of it, or are they going to appeal? Well, you, our, our attorneys were actually kind of shocked that the, the decision from the three-judge panel was unanimous. And so they weren't really expecting that. And so the expectation before this ruling was that the NAACP, if they were to lose, would definitely appeal it to the Supreme Court. But because of the unanimous decision, they think there's no chance at all despite the fact the NAACP has spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars suing us over what is clearly a free speech issue. So we think it's over and done, and the emotional burden lifted from my wife, Bethany, and my shoulders and the Radiance Foundation's shoulders is, is awesome. We're well, feeling good. this goes to the a theme that we've talked about here recently, where and, and we talked about earlier today. Uh, they're not wanting to engage us anymore. They're just wanting to shut us up. That's right. And we're not going to be shut up. And, 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 and we're well used to it. And Ryan, my understanding is that the court was saying that, look, you know, copyright infringement is one thing, but you guys can't use this to shield yourselves from criticism, right? Exactly. And that's Which what they want to do. They, they can't take do. it. Well, you know, I was thinking the whole time, I, I, I might have made this point on a previous show, Ryan, I was thinking if, if basically what you did was satire, and, and that's protected speech. If if they had right. if they had prevailed in this deal, I think shows like Saturday Night Live would be in danger of being taken off the air. Of course, because and they do it for money. They, I mean, that's a commercial transaction. Writing a news article is not a commercial transaction, at least on, on my part. You know, as a citizen journalist, but the, the ruling was the same. In fact, the, the lower court judge said that 
the, the parody name is not actually truly a parody because he didn't find it to be funny. So he determined it's not actually a parody. It's not satire. Because he didn't think it was funny. No. But the, 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 the three judges at the Fourth Circuit Court didn't care for his definition of parody, and they clearly labeled it such and understood it to be so. And it, whether it was a parody or not wouldn't matter. Any criticism, that kind of criticism is completely covered and protected by the First Amendment. It's, you know, to me, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously thrilled that, that, that this was the outcome, but to me, it, it's, it's bizarre that it even got this far. How could you, even in the lower court, how could you put people on the bench who would have this view that you can be silenced because they don't like what the message is that you're giving? Oh, perhaps it might have something to do with a liberal black judge appointed by, and I am half white, half black, by the way, people, but a liberal black judge appointed by Clinton whose wife's sister was a former president of the, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Maybe that had something to do Maybe with it. Maybe that had something to do with it. But it, it just goes back to, back to what I've said many times here. The American judicial system is in a state of collapse. And um, it, we, anyway, we don't want to get into that, but we see this all the time. Anyway, Ryan, I'm, I'm very proud of you. Thank, uh, thank you for coming on. And uh, we're really happy for you. Thank you. And I'm just, just overjoyed to be working with each and every one of you across this country to keep illuminating the truth, no matter the consequences. I know that's what we do all the time. Right. Well, thank you for, and your family for, for, like you said, it's, it's an emotion, it takes an emotional toll to, to, to uh, be in this kind of litigation. And, uh, but, you know, you're, you're advancing a, a right for, for all of us, and, and, and it's a right that we as pro-lifers need to understand, freedom of speech. Speech is protected precisely because it's going to offend, it's going to insult, it's going to criticize others, others aren't going to like it, others are going to try to shut it down. That's not why it should be shut down. That's precisely why it needs to be protected. Well, exactly. right? the, the First Amendment was designed to protect speech that people don't like. That's that basically don't what like. you're saying. Right. If, if everybody likes the speech, you don't need to be protecting it. <laughs> Everybody's right. happy. You know? We're all friends and we're smiling. I mean, I'm offended when I see um, people go on television and defend the, the right to an abortion. I'm offended by that. But nobody's arguing that they sh they don't have the right to to make their that's argument right. and, and that's right. You know and that's the old saying the um, the the cure for bad speech is more speech, right? <laughs> exactly. And uh, Amen. anyway, Ryan, thanks for joining us. Thank you, thank Ta you, Mark. Thank you, guys. Take thank care. You. Bye bye. Um, he he mentioned the um, Alliance Defending Freedom, and we had a couple of news stories today. They're, they're these guys are really coming on the front, forefront they're real, and we've yeah. talked about them we talked to them it seems like every month we have some victory that they're they're involved in but we had a couple of stories in the news about them uh, another group is the ACLJ of course American Center for Law and Justice there's a situation going up going on up in uh, New Jersey uh, with a woman named Gerald Turco and you know it, this goes back to what we were saying earlier today and, and a minute ago about how they don't want to engage anymore they don't. They can't defend their position. So now they're just going to try to shut us down. And um, this is going on up in New Jersey. We're seeing this all over the country, by the way. But uh, there's a there's a big case up in New Jersey. Um, the the lady who's involved in this was not available for the show, but her attorney was Frank Mannion from the American Center for Law and Justice. Joins us from Louisville, Kentucky. Hello, Frank. Hey, Mark. How are you? I'm just fine, sir. Thank you for being with us. A um, give the audience a little, just a quick thumbnail. Uh, analysis of what's going on up here with this with this lady. Sure. Well, General Turco is one, uh, just like thousands and thousands of other sidewalk counselors who over the years have uh, taken a stand literally and figuratively outside of abortion facilities. In order to help the women, uh, talk them out of what they're about to do to their child, and in some cases they're there when they come out to offer them assistance, help, spiritual, physical, material, whatever it is they need, to, uh, to deal with the consequences of what they've done. Uh, and as you know, throughout the years, in various places and in various ways, the owners of the clinics or the mills want to shut this kind of free speech down, speaking of free speech. And one of the ways they do it uh, is by enacting these so-called buffer zone laws. Um, in New Jersey, in Englewood, New Jersey, there's an abortion mill that's been around forever, uh, notorious, I mean, Metropolitan Medical Associates. And uh, Gerald Turco is one of those people who goes out there Saturday morning, sometimes during the week, to sidewalk council. And in 2014, the city of Englewood enacted a buffer zone, 
modeled on the one in Massachusetts that ultimately ended up being struck down by the Supreme Court, that on the, in effect keeps pro-lifers of any kind, not just silo counselors, but protesters as well, away from the entire front of the building. So whereas before they were able to walk next to and accompany women uh, right up to the door of the building and try to persuade them to change their minds, offer them help, now they're not allowed to do that. Uh, and if they should dare to cross one of these buffer zone lines, they're subjected to a minimum fine of $1,000 uh, plus the potential for 90 days in jail. And, and this would be for any every violation. So every day they're out there, these, uh, these fines, potential jail sentences would accumulate. So that's the law that we've challenged. We filed suit in federal court in Newark, New Jersey, and we're just kind of getting off the ground here. Uh, but we plan to stay with this all the way to the Supreme Court if we have to. You know, let me ask you this question, and, and this is obviously just a theoretical mm -hmm. question. Let's just say you're in a state that's that's pretty heavily pro-union. Right. This wouldn't happen in a state like Texas, for example. But you're in a state that's pretty heavily pro-union. What if they said that this buffer zone would apply if, if let's say these these clinic workers in in that in that abortion mill were to unionize? And then they were going to have some sort of work stoppage or some sort of action against that abortion clinic. What would happen if they, if the, if the uh, state said, "Okay, you can do that, but you can't come within a certain number of feet of the abortion clinic while you do this"? <laughs> yeah, I mean that that would be interesting, uh, and, and would never happen because of the uh, the political clout uh, of the union, I'm sure. And, and really, this whole thing is about political clout and the squeaky wheel, because this law was pushed in Englewood by North Jersey chapter of the National Organization for Women. Uh, the, the local people uh, saw no need for it. Uh, the chief of police testified against it in front of the city council and said, we don't need this out there. Yeah, there's, there's times when the crowd gets kind of, uh, you know, not out of control, but loud, and there's occasionally some jostling and pushing maybe between the escorts and, and the pro-lifers. But we have existing laws that cover any actual violations, any actual obstructions or, or uh, assaults, which uh, apparently has never happened because there's never been a prosecution for one. And so, yeah, but now has a lot of clout in New Jersey, particularly in that part of the state, and they got this thing pushed through. They were able to point to the Massachusetts law. But what happened in the interim was the Massachusetts law was struck down by the Supreme Court last summer. So we're really what our case is, is I think probably the first attempt to apply that Supreme Court decision in the McCullen case on a case-by-case -case basis around the country and to challenge these ridiculous buffer zone laws. It's, it's really unbelievable when you think about it. But again, I, would, I, I mean, obviously you know how to litigate your case. I'm not an attorney. I would make that argument, though, about the union. Oh, yeah. If, if you're in a heavily union state like New Jersey is, like I said, it's not like you're, you're trying this in Texas. But in a heavily union state like New Jersey, I would make that argument. Say, would would unions be prohibited from approaching a certain, could, could a business, let's say that you've got a GM assembly plant there, could they say, we want a 500-foot buffer zone? No, and traditionally, you know, as we all know, things sometimes happen where there's a union picketing or union on strike in front of a business, and the owner of the business does have some legal recourse, but it's not a buffer zone. What it is is an injunction against particularly, you know, egregious acts such as pushing and shoving or, or actual violence. Um, you can do that if you can show a record that these things are occurring, but you can't shut down speech entirely, either for a union or for a sidewalk counselor. That's just a basic principle of First Amendment law. And, you know, thankfully, last summer, the Supreme Court, the McCullen case, recognized this. I mean, that was a nine to zero opinion. Every justice signed on to that opinion saying that the Massachusetts law, which is pretty much identical to the one we're challenging, goes too far uh, in regulating speech in a public sidewalk. So we're hopeful that, that we'll get a similar result here. Now, are you guys seeing other cases? Are you going to be involved in other cases like this? Because as you know, as, as you alluded to earlier, that's just one of, we're seeing this all over the country. Right. Are you going right. to get involved? And, you know, in and, and the, pro the problem is the Supreme Court decision in McCullen. Uh, you know, I, I guess in order to get a nine-justice unanimous decision, Justice Roberts kind of, in our opinion, had to water down the basis of his decision. 
uh, Alito and Scalia were not all that happy with it, although they signed on to it. Um, so he, he, you know, the decision is on a very broad or actually a very narrow basis that this was not the least restrictive way for um, Massachusetts to go about dealing with the problem. And, and they gave some examples of other ways that towns could deal with disruptions, obstructions outside of abortion clinics. So it wouldn't surprise me at all to see places at the instigation of a now or a NARAL or, or the local pro-choice uh, loudmouths to try and enact similar laws. And, and we're, you know, we're more than willing to go and challenge them wherever they pop up. Well, good. <laughs> I'm glad. Um, you know, we, we've got to have organizations like ACLJ and Absolutely. Alliance Defending Freedom and, and the others that are out there. Because um, the, the pro-lifers, you know, if, if you think about it for a minute, for the first, what, 20 years or so, we really didn't do that. Right. We just, we just kind of took whatever, we, whatever the state tried to give, you know. Yeah. Ever, That's right. And you look back at the early days of Operation Rescue, for example, right. and where they're filing these motion and limine case charges, I mean, uh, motions against rescuers. Right. Just to get rid of the cases. That's, that's the only exactly. reason they're, they're doing that. And, and there was... I'll give you a good example of this, uh, Frank. And I'm, did you defend any of the rescuers under? Were you around at that time? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. hundreds, hundreds. <laughs> All right, I'll give you a, a, an example of something we had here. We had a young lady, one of my first employees when I first started Life Dynamics. She had rescued in Dallas. Now rescuers right. knew they were going to be arrested, and they knew there were consequences for for doing civil disobedience. That's the nature of civil disobedience. You're saying I'm willing to take the consequences. When her trial came up, they filed a motion in limine against her, which means the prosecution asked the judge to rule that she couldn't use certain words in her defense. Right. And they gave her, they literally gave her a list of 28 words that she couldn't use in her defense. Yeah. I remember a few of them. Abortion was one, baby, right. child, yeah, killing, incredible. murder, just go down the line. They gave her right. 28 words that she could not use in her defense. Now, when the trial then started, the, the judge approved this motion in limine. When the trial started, what can she say, right? <laughs> so she sits there, and they uh, find her guilty in this courtroom in Dallas. They find her guilty. They give her two years for um, obstruction of this front door of this abortion clinic. They give her two years in, in, the, in jail, and then they suspend the sentence. Right. All right, trial's over. Well, she's livid, of course, about this motion in limine. And she asked her, her attorney, can they really do this? He said, well, they did do it. He said, but it is the basis for an appeal. Right. They will let you, you can appeal this, and you will win at the appellate, appellate level on this, and you'll get a new trial. <clears throat> but in the new trial, they're not going to grant you, they're going to find you guilty again. That's but but they're not going to grant you probation, and you're going to go to the state penitentiary for two years. Uh -huh. now, she's a 28-year-old woman with two children. And she says, so now they put me in a position where I can't have a trial and I can't appeal. I can't afford to take the risk of appeal. So she just had to accept it. And that's how they were getting rid of all these cases. Right. All right. I mean, I mean what does it say about the other side? And this goes along with what you were talking about before this, um, you know, the, the calling a, an unborn child a pregnancy. What does it say about the other side when they can, cannot tolerate, they cannot tolerate even speech, honest, factual speech about what they do? I mean, do they ever think about that? They, they, they can't even listen to honest facts about what it is that they're all about. I mean, to me, that kind of says it all. Yeah, Frank, that's, that's such all a... That's these cases are about at, at the bottom, free speech cases. That, that's such an important observation, Frank, and I, I saw it recently in, uh, in Kansas. I was out in Kansas with Governor Brownback uh, for uh, one of the signings, uh, bill signings for this, uh, this uh, law now protecting children from dismemberment abortions. And when it was being debated in the Kansas Senate, the, the, the lone two senators who spoke up in opposition to this law, they couldn't even say the name of the, of the bill that they were opposing. That's so ridiculous. I mean, you get up... You say the, na the name of the bill. The reason they couldn't say it was that the, the, the name of the bill includes the word dismemberment. Right. So they just can't right. come well, that's what all That's what all of these free speech cases are about when it comes to abortion. The other side cannot, cannot deal with it. They cannot deal with it. I mean, our client in this case, Gerald Turco, is the most mild-mannered, uh, peaceful, loving person 
who uh, I've seen her in action out there, and she just tries to approach these women who are obviously in a horrible state of anxiety, fear, everything else, uh, and speak to them lovingly. Um, and, you know, the people that own the building can't deal with that. They, right. They've got to sur surround the woman with the, the death scorts who start screaming all sorts of nonsense, and they have to go and get a law enacted to keep Gerald and people like Gerald even further away so that they really can't get near these women. Well, and, and they, they cannot, cannot tolerate the truth. They cannot handle dissent. It, you're, you're supposed to just blindly accept. Mm. Right. And you know, Renee, we've talked about uh, before about the number of women that, we've, that you and I talked to mm -hmm. that call in here who are post-aborted, and how many of them will tell you, I was, I was sitting in that waiting room hoping something would happen. Right. That somebody would come in and say, hey, it's okay for you to get up and leave. Or somebody would yeah. give me some information. You know what? Yeah. Not only do we know that, those people that are running that abortion mill know that. That's they right. They know that, yeah. They know that. Right. They do. And so that's what, when you boil it all down, that's what this comes down to. Yeah. Is you cannot, if you're running an abortion clinic, you cannot allow dissent. Everybody has to yeah. be on the same page. Yeah, and, and not only that, Mark, but what they really want to do is get the sidewalk counselors out of there. Because right, once right. you get the sidewalk counselors out of there, the only people who can or, or who are going to be near it are the people who have to shout and yell, and that's what they want to portray our side as. Right. You know, well, loud, ultimately... confrontational, obnoxious, scary people. Uh, they don't want the Gerald Turcos of the world out there because they don't fit in with the, the template that they've decided right. uh, is what pro-lifers really are. Well, and what they're doing is they're calling it bullying, but they're eliminating choice is what they're doing. Right. They're silencing actual options for women because as anyone who stood out on the sidewalk has seen, time and again, a lot of these women are being coerced. You're watching oh, them, yeah. you know, a guy yeah. who has her arm grabbed and he's taking her in there. And this is truly another option for someone to come in and advocate for a woman who is being coerced into an abortion, who is being forced, who has no choice. You have peaceful sidewalk counselors out there who can call the police or assist the woman or find out if this really is truly her choice to go in there yeah. and offer her an alternative. And they want to take that choice away. So for them to be called the pro-choice side is is absolutely heinous. Well, choices, we've said it many times here, choice is a one-way street. Yeah. Abortion can be chosen, but it cannot be unchosen. Right. And that's what this all has come down to. Well, hey, Frank, thanks right. for joining us. And, uh, sure thing, Mark. Everybody else. Keep us, posted, keep us posted on how this is going. We want to follow this. We'll and, and there'll be other ones out there, I'm sure. Okay, Mark. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Well, the battle continues. The battle continues. Thank God for these kind of attorneys. And, you know, there's two sides to the coin, though. I mean, these attorneys do their work, ACLJ, right. ADF. They get lots of victories. They get lots of victories because, you know, it's built into the American fabric that you have right. freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom to protest. But what's the other side of the coin? The other side of the coin is that the pro-life activists, our friends who watch this, this Life Talk program regularly and those that they associate with, my goodness, if we don't make use of the rights that attorneys like Frank Mannion are successfully defending, right. what's the end result is going to be just as if they had lost the case. We've got to get out there and use these rights. We've got to get out there and sidewalk counsel. Absolutely. And this might be a good point at which to mention at the end of July, uh, Mark, there's the, uh, the annual sidewalk counseling training symposium. Our friend Brian Gibson of Pro-Life right. Action Ministries has been organizing this for the last uh, few years. It'll be in Chicago. It'll be July 24th and 25th, Friday night and into Saturday. I'll be speaking at it as well as many other uh, uh, national uh, advocates and, and uh, those that train on sidewalk counseling. So I want to encourage our friends to spread the word. Absolutely. And attend if they can. Yeah, the rights don't do you any good if you don't use them. Got to use them. Got to use the right. right. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Good show. Thank you, Renee. Destiny, I think you're going to be back next month, aren't you? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll but you there. won't be. <laughs> Next month. I think you're off next month. I think you're, I might have to. Uh, next. Yeah, and I think Troy will be back. Anyway, we'll see. Whoever's here is here. We'll see. <laughs> Whoever God wants to be here will be here. <laughs> anyway, good show, guys. Thanks. Unfortunately, again, we're out of time, but don't ever forget, Life Dynamics is not here to put up a good fight. We're here to win because winning is how this killing is going to stop. We'll see you next month.